The final hour today is on Monday, 2nd of September, 1st of September today? 2nd, yeah. I think the winter will be here soon. Yeah, 14 days we will have the first snow. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you have been there, you know, you have seen all the snow we have made. Yeah. Okay, so this was... Um, we agreed on the, that this number, 411, kind of secures that we are able to kind of cover all aggregated demand through all this period, and uh, we cannot have it any lower than that. Of course we can have it much higher if you like, but in that case it will be too much, okay? So, let us... Uh, know it worked. Now I can move to 3, 4. Uh, here we have the consequences of uh, this um, plan. Uh, we hire 111 people at day one, uh, which then of course results in a total amount of employees of 411. And if you now multiply up with this B, number of units produced per worker, we get uh, a production number here. Here actually you have the cumulative production and the cumulative net demand. So you can kind of see how it changes here. He, at this point you have 12.05. Uh, then demand takes 7.80, so 12.05 minus 7.80 should produce 4.25, which you put in inventory in the first period. And then uh, up to that point you have, uh, you produce 14.45 then here in, the, in February. And if you add that to 1205, you get 2650, that should seem reasonable. And if you add the demand number, which is not here, 2780, you get 1420. So at this point, you have 2650 available and uh, 1420, which is kind of taken out, and you end up with 1230. So this is the actual end inventory as it moves around. <coughs> so you see what's happening here is, of course, that you have a single hire in only one period, so you hire 411, there's actually 111 persons in the first period, but of course you build up a lot, lot more inventory. So you'd perhaps expect that the costs here are not that different between these two plans. Uh, and finally we can of course evaluate these plans. Uh, that is straightforward to do. Mm -mm. Uh, let's do it. <coughs> Okay, so uh, this constant work force plan involves hiring one, one, one immediately. Evaluating this plan. Means that we have an inventory cost first. Inventory. Uh, the cost was 80. Times. 5. 9. 62. And uh, then uh, in the textbook they kind of add this 600 here as well, you know, we kind of made this obligation to have 600 uh, residing into the last finishing period. And this turns out to be 524,960. Uh, and this is of course the major part of the cost in this case, but there is a little hiring. Hiring which is uh, 111 times 500, which is 55,500. So we end up here with 580,460. Uh, this was slightly more expensive than the previous one, wasn't it? Maybe not that extensive. Uh, here it is. 
five. No, it was cheaper, wasn't it? No, it was slightly more expensive. This the, the previous one one was five seventy two nine hundred. This is the cost constant work force plan CWFP, and this was the minimal inventory plan MIP. Let's call it that. Okay. So you see that. Um, these two plants has one which is cheaper than the other, which is not very surprising. But the main interest here is to kind of identify the fact that, the, of course, there is an infinite amount of possible other plants here. It could produce slightly slower, slightly more, use a little bit more inventory, a little bit less inventory, a little bit less extreme minimal fire, hiring and firing as here, or a little bit less extreme hiring and firing as in the other plant. And that is kind of the main point of this part, that we kind of are led into understanding that there is a kind of room to play in here. We can change our decision variables much more than we do in these two extreme plans. And somewhere in between here, there must be a plan, at least reasonably, that is cheaper than the cheapest one of these two. And of course, that is the case. We can allocate our resources more efficient than this. Uh, of course, uh, in a very unlikely situation, you could be able to get one of these plans as the, the, the optimal or the, 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 the plan with the smallest cost, but that is not the case in this example. So the next step then is to introduce linear programming as a tool, first in general, and then to use it on this problem here. The first thing we need to do then when we do linear program is to formulate a model. Okay, we need to kind of construct a model which embraces the logic behind this structure here. This may to some extent seem difficult, but actually it's not that hard. Uh, it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward. Be before we kind of move into this matter, I think I need to give you a short introduction to linear program. If you, I don't know, have you had it, learned it before? The yeah, you have had it. What about you, Joe? You all have it. So you know linear programming, then, basically. A little bit, okay. Well, we don't know how much, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't plan to do it very extensive. I don't. So, th have you learned anything about algorithms, the simplex algorithm? Actually, we just uh, learned to understand it and explain a model. Okay, so you didn't you didn't talk too much about how to solve it. No. No. Then we can spend a little time on that. Okay, mm -hmm. a little bit, not much, just a tiny bit. Okay. Uh, so I, th I think, in any case, I will just run through this as I have planned it. It's, um, it doesn't take that much time, I think. It's, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, now the key to doing mathematical modeling, you, you all kind of remember these exercises from your basic school, don't you? You, you had this, uh, what was it, you know, you know, John and Mary are 24 years together. Uh, Peter is twice as old as Mary. How old are John? Do you remember these uh, exercises? Have you seen those? Yeah, we, we, we did this in the basic uh, school, didn't we? So mathematical modeling is a lot about doing this, kind of having a kind of description of reality. Uh, and the idea is to try to kind of put reality into variables in such a way that you can use the outcoming model. This is not necessarily easy. Actually, like the, in many cases, you get Nobel Prizes for being very good at this. So this is not everybody's. Uh, it's not for everybody, so to speak. Uh, what do we get out of this one? Now we can say that xj is John's age, can't we? We can say that xm is Mary's age, can't we? And there is another uncertainty here. This is John. We have to. That was a bit unfortunate, wasn't it? J, we have two J's, so we should change his name then. Okay. We're calling something else. What about Paul? That's good. 
No, Peter it was. Peter, no problem. How old are John? That was okay. I'm sorry, this was okay. It was John, Peter, and Mary, then it's okay. So XP is Peter's age. And as it says here, you know, uh, XJ, that is John, and XM, that is Mary, they are 24 years together, aren't they? Agree? Yeah, this is a mathematical relation describing this first sentence here. What about the second one? If I take two times Mary's age, I should get Peter's age, okay? So now I have constructed two equations here. Uh, is this enough? Can we find ages based on these two equations? No, we need one more, don't we? Yeah, so it wasn't complete. So we can say here that uh, they are all are all 50 years together, huh? Then we can solve it. So you see, this is kind of... In some cases, when you actually do mathematical modeling at the professional level, you have to do like I did here. You kind of look at the kind of partial description of reality and by modeling it, you observe that I miss something. It's not enough. So then you have to kind of broaden your understanding of the problem and add necessarity, necessary information to make a workable mathematical model. And this is not an obvious process to do. It, it, it takes a lot of training, actually, to, to make it. So in this case, of course, we have xj plus x Mary plus x Peter equal to 50 as well. So now we have three equations in the three unknowns, so now it can be solved. Maybe. I don't know. Can we solve it now? Are we guaranteed? Uh, not necessarily. If you're unlucky, you know, it could be that kind of two of these equations contain the same information in a way. But uh, if you look at it, it doesn't seem like that here. But uh, in a sense, what we're trying to do here, <laughs> in this case, is to try to find an intersection between two lines, isn't it? Even though it's in a broader space. And if these two lines look like this, then of course they don't have the intersection. Okay, so that could kind of make troubles for us. So we have to think in many directions and in many ways when we do mathematical modeling. But the basics kind of remains. We have to define some variables. We have to transform a description or understanding or task given to us into a mathematical language in such a way that we can do something with that mathematical language. And if we deal with linear programming or optimization, the idea is to construct something like this, but also construct something we call an objective, which tells us what we really want to achieve. So if you do optimization, it would be typical that you didn't have this last equation here, because then there would be some degrees of freedom here to kind of change our axis and bias or whatever they are, such that we can kind of increase our objective. This, in this system, given that it has a single solution, there is no point in doing optimization, okay? because everything is given here. If you want to optimize, there must be some more degrees of freedom exist, uh, uh, existing. So you cannot kind of use too many of these equality constraints, as we call them. In that case, it kind of kills your optimization space. But uh, this will be clearer as we move along. So let me take this silly example out. And if you like, of course, you can try to solve it. Now it's just uh, taking this one, putting it in for... Uh, what's that sign? P. P. Yeah, you have to put it in there, okay? The J, M, M, J, M. Then you have two equations. Repeat here, put in the third, and then you can hopefully solve it, but uh, that was not the point. So instead, let's look at an example. Before we take an example, I think I should try to uh, tell you what a linear programming problem is. Okay, you, you probably know already. But uh, we have a structure. LP means linear program. Uh, 
and there is a certain structure here. There is an objective, let's call that set, which is a function of some variables, x1 up to xn. And if you look at linear programs, this f here is a linear function. Which in this case, of course, means that we can write set as something like this, c1x1 plus c2x2 plus cn xn in a general space, so to speak. If it's not linear, then we have something called nonlinear programming, for instance. Okay, so it's different types of these programs, depending on the structure of the problem. And then there must be some constraints. If not, this would be silly, wouldn't it? Suppose I want to maximize this function here. Let me do a minus there, 3x2. Okay, this is a linear function, 2x1 minus 3x2. I want to maximize this function. We can see the solution immediately, can't we? I can do that by putting x2 equal to 0 and x1 equal to infinity. In that case, I get my maximal result. But that doesn't make any sense, does it? The point here is, of course, that reality doesn't produce these kind of solutions. This would kind of either be a zero cost or an infinite profit type of solution. And we, we typically don't achieve that. So there is something kind of constraining us, which prevents us from taking the easy way out, so to speak, which is this. So we need some constraints here, unless the linear objectives should be banal. Okay? There's no point in having any theory dealing with these kind of problems, because we see the solution immediately. You just put all negative coefficients to zero and, and all positive to infinity. So we, we, get, we don't get anything out of it. So there must be a set of constraints. And as it's a linear program, these constraints should also be linear. Okay? So there is something like a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2 plus, and so on, up to a1n times xn, and that should be smaller than or equal to a certain constant b1. So this is a linear term, linear constraint, and we typically write it with a less than or equal constraint in, in the standard form as we call it. And it could be, of course, a lot of these ones. Suppose we have m constraints. In that case, the last one would be a m1 x1 plus a m2 x2 plus finally a m n xn less than or equal to bm. Okay? And we normally also assume here that there are so-called non-negativity demands. So all x's, xi, is assumed positive for all i. This means for all. It's a we with a dash on, if you haven't seen it before. It's a shortened way of writing for all in mathematics. So this is a linear program. This is how we define it. It contains an objective, which we want to either maximize or minimize, and a set of constraints. All constraints plus the objective must be linear functions. You probably observe immediately that when you have this function, there's no point in adding any constants here. Okay? If you think about the function, which looks like this, and you're aiming for finding this optimal value, Adding a constant just moves it up, so it doesn't change the optimal value. So we don't need to bother with these potential constants, they can just be removed. <laughs> there are other tricks here, which we, we may return to or may not, I haven't decided yet. Okay? It's, um, it's a question of what we need here, actually. When it comes to solving these problems, there was a guy called Donsich invented an algorithm which he called the simplex algorithm many years ago, 50 years or something. This concept here was, became kind of popular during the Second World War when the Brits were trying to kind of... They had invented the radar, you know. At some point, uh, 
early before the Second World War. And of course they found out that they can use this radar to spot enemy planes. And the, uh, the, the problem then they faced was, was kind of how to launch these radar posts to cover a certain area. Should you put uh, everybody together, should you spread them, and in what way should you spread them. And, and these problems kind of uh, accelerated the development of these methods here. And from that time on, this has been a, turned out to be a very convenient tool in many cases. The main problem is perhaps that it kind of assumes linearity. But the nice thing about this is that solving these problems are extremely easy. And today's computers can basically solve as big problems as you like. There is kind of no practical limit today in solving linear programs. However, if you introduce some peculiarities here, uh, non-linearities or certain discrete variables, which we will return to later on, it is difficult, still. But these problems, they are normally as routinely solved in, in the size you like. So there is kind of really no effort. I will, I will briefly kind of discuss the, the algorithmic concept here, to, to kind of get you to understand how it works. It's, it's really not that difficult. Okay, let's look at an example. <coughs> What time is it? Okay. Example. Let me just think for a moment. Okay. Now we're here. Okay, we spend a little time on this example. It's, it's really easy. Okay, um, there is um, a situation. Uh, a factory where you can produce factory produce two types of desks. You know what a desk is? It's like this, isn't it? Yeah, this is a desk. So there are two types. There's something called a roll top. You know what a roll top desk is? The kind of desk where you have this uh, up here and you have a roll top so you can take up, okay? Yeah. And there's a regular one which you where you don't have this roll top. So there's also a regular one here. Presumably this regular one kind of produces uh, demands less resources in one way or another. Uh, there is raw material here. We normally use wood for these desktops. Wood, that seems reasonable. And there is some uh, use here of this wood. And there are different types of wood which are used here. A roll top uses 10 square feet. You know, uh, you know a square feet is, yeah, how much is a square feet? Something like this. 35 times 35 centimeters or something, yeah. Oh, this tree called pine. You know what the pine is? It's these long, very thin trees, okay? They're not very common in Norway, but in other countries they are. Kind of common, okay? And uh, it uh, uses four square feet of cedar. You know what the cedar tree is? Yeah. Again, not very common in Norway. Again, much more common in your countries, okay? But this final one is fairly common in Norway. 15 square feet of maple. You know maple? You have these leaves, they look like uh, the Canadian flag. Canadian. Yeah, There's something called maple syrup. Okay, and of course this uh, other uh, one, this was the roll top, and the regular one also had some consumption of these different trees. 20 square feet of pine, 16 square feet of cedar, and 10 square feet of maple. You see, it, this one uses more maple relatively, more cedar, more pine. 
Uh, this is always con confused with, with this example. And the regular one uses, in general, more resources than the roll top. Maybe it's a very big regular one then, perhaps. It seems so. Okay. Now we have some availability of this tree. We have 200 square feet of pine. We have 128 square feet of cedar. And we have uh, 220 square feet of maple available. And then there must be some kind of economical means here. And it, to make this something we would like to optimize, either we would be interested in kind of uh, trying to use as a small amount of certain of these products here, or we, there must be some kind of link to some economical measures. So there is uh, uh, a profit measure here, which is defined. The roll top gives $115 profits per desk. Profits. So we have kind of looked both into revenues and costs here and kind of combined that into a single number. While the regular is not as profitable, it only produces $90 per desk in profits. So we have these two numbers, which probably should be in our objective, don't you think so? That is kind of what we would like to do here. So if you want to do the following, how many uh, desks to produce. We take these out. in order to maximize profits. So this desktop producer is kind of greedy. He would like to maximize his profits. That's perhaps not so weird. So what we need to do now is to identify decision variables. What kind of decisions can this producer make? There's of course a lot of decisions here that could be kind of relevant to look at here, but it's, it's kind of obvious that if he wants to maximize profit based on these two numbers, you must kind of link one decision variable to the roll top and one to the regular. Don't you think so? So if you say that x1 is the number of, what does it say here, roll tops produced, produced, then we could use x2 as the number of regulars produced. I will just finish this example and then I will stop for today. Okay? Just uh, modeling it. So always when we model a linear program or any other kind of program for that matter, we need an objective and we need constraints. Okay, so let's start with the objective. That's very easy to come up with here. Because we have the values here, this one. For each desk, I get $115. So if I multiply 115 by x1, that produces the profit contribution from one half of my production. And then I take multiply 90 with my x2, I get the other half, so to speak, of my profit contribution. So my objective is straightforward to write up. So let me just take this out. We often use the term set for an objective. Just auto habit, I think. <coughs> you want to maximize, we often write it like this. Set equal to 115 times x1 plus 90 times x2. That is straightforward, okay? Not much of a problem. But as we said previously, this doesn't make much, much sense without any constraints, because if you can kind of increase x1 and x2, we would try to do it 
infinitely here, okay? Both we kind of produce an infinite profit, and uh, that is uh, a fairly uncommon situation in practice anyway. So, let us look for some constraints here. It seems kind of obvious here that we had some available stuff of the different tree types, and we can, cannot kind of use more in our production than we have available. In practice, of course, this would not be the case. You could always buy more raw material. But here we kind of assume that we look in a short period of time, I think, and then we have to stick to the fact that there were certain amounts available. There were a certain amount of cedar, a certain amount of pine, and a certain amount of maple. And then we can construct a set of constraints, can't we? We often write it like this, ST means subject to, and then we write the constraints as they come along down here. We cannot use more than what is available of each raw material here. And those availabilities are up here, aren't they? So each time I produce this roll top, I spend 10 units of pine. So these construct the total consumption of pine by producing the roll tops. Uh, this regular one uses twice as much, so it will be 20 times x2, and that must be less than or equal to the amount available, 200. Uh, if, you if you remember the numbers, it was 4 alpine, no, sorry, cedar, by producing the roll top, it was 16 of cedar by producing the regular, and the availability here is 120. Uh, it says 128 in my, yeah, I sorry, again a misprint, this should be 128, sorry about that, like this, okay, and finally this maple constraint, it was a 15 consumption on the roll top and a 10 consumption of the, ah, sorry, on the regular, uh, the availability was 220. And of course, we cannot produce negative amounts of any of these two desks, so both x1 and x2 must be positive. And this is a very simple linear program, which is kind of obvious. In most practical cases, it's a bit more hard than that. Uh, so this is an example which is constructed kind of to be easy, and it, it is really easy. Okay. Next time, which is tomorrow, we will solve this example. Then I will introduce a software package to you, which solves linear programs and many other types of programs. So we can use through this course. We will use a free demo version. And of course you need a computer to use it. These are not the kind of problems you solve on paper. If there are a certain size, this is in fact impossible. It's not possible to do it right, so you need a computer to do this. Even though it's not necessarily hard or takes much time. It's kind of a very big administrative problem to solve it. But there is a certain very simple logic behind the way we solve it, and we will discuss that as well. Then after that, we'll take this learning into the problem we looked at today and formulate a linear programming version of that model, which is slightly more demanding, I think. And then after that, we finish chapter 3. So if you're lucky, we finish chapter 3 tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This is not bad. Two weeks, two chapters. Okay. That's good. Okay. Next week, we will go through the exercise and teach a uh, lecture a little bit more on uh, the next chapter, which may be lot sizing or newsboy problems. I haven't decided yet. We will see.
So that's all for today. Have a nice afternoon, a nice dinner. The weather doesn't seem so bad today. It seems uh, like the sun is at least partially around. Okay. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Then we.